Thank you, Ryan. Hello, everyone. Only see known names <laughs> in the possibility, so I guess you, I could spare myself from the, my usual speech. Um, you will know that this is a public meeting. Everybody is welcome to join and contribute. There is two requirements, which is to be aware and live by the antitrust policy and then the code of conduct. I hope I won't get in trouble for skipping through this. I don't think I can make it faster. So um, we have a couple of announcements to get started. There's the usual reminder Right. Do you want to say something about? Yeah. Over? So De Dev Weekly is like our one of our uh, big ways to reach out to developers, and uh, it's it's for you and hopefully by you. Uh, and we are really looking for participation. Um, it really helps. Last week was pretty tough because we couldn't, you know, sift through all the PRs and find super cool stuff. Um, so you know, give us a hand, please, and. Uh, the Hyperledger mentorship program uh, is getting ready to kick off. Min is on the call if anyone has any questions, but it's pretty straightforward. Yeah, thanks, Rai. Uh, I just want to do a quick announcement. Uh, we've done this a few iterations. I think this is the fifth year we're doing this. Um, so today we're actually kicking off the call for any active contributors and um, uh, maintainers, <laughs> if possible, um, to submit a project proposal. Um, so uh, I put the links there. So take a look at the uh, kind of a general description of the program, the timeline for this year. Uh, and also there's a template that you can just click on if you're interested in uh, mentoring and submitting a project proposal. We're actually looking for 20 to 25 um, projects. Um, this year to, to open up for applications for mentees to apply. Um, this year for mentee, one of the things that we changed is that in the past years, we wanted the mentee applicants to be enrolled college and university students. Doesn't matter which part of the world you're from, but you have to be a, a student. But we decided to uh, remove that requirement. So we're opening up to you know students and non-students alike. Uh, hopefully this gave us a bigger broader pool of, uh, you know, uh, applicants to draw from. Um, obviously, we have the full-time schedule, which starts, uh, so, so both full-time and part-time mentees start on June 1st. So if you're full-time, you just do it for North America, you know, it's summer, you know, June, July, and August. If you're doing it part-time, it's going to run from June through uh, November. So part-time really is for people who may have other commitments, such as, you know, uh, some people may still be going to school or have another, uh, you know, job. Uh, so part time will be a really flexible uh, option for people to 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 still, you know, work on these projects and become part of our community. So if you have any questions, let me know. Uh, otherwise, um, yeah, I'm just here and uh, that's it. Right. Thanks. Sure, Tracy. Thank you, Min. Yeah. So Min, a question for you. Um, given the timelines, right, that we're submitting uh, applications now for selection for June, mm -hmm. what, are, what are the recommendations or uh, best practices that you might have for submitting something that we may not know what is actually coming in June um, that would need to be done for a particular project? Um, I, I, you know, obviously, timelines always become an issue and I guess we're wondering like if we submitted something for something specific and the you know things change or things shift how does that how does that end up playing out yeah, good question. So right now we're asking, you know, any but uh, people in the community who want to mentor to submit a project proposal. So we're opening this today and we give people six weeks um, to get the proposals on the wiki. And then we have, uh, you know, probably a subgroup of the TSC members to review all the proposals that came in. Um, then we'll select 20 to 25 uh proposals and we'll open those up for applications on um, the Linux Foundation, it's called LFX Mentorship. Uh, so we, if your project is selected um, by the 
Hyperledger TSC and open, and then we will post it on the LFX mentorship uh, applica uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the app and you will get applicants for sure. You'll be able to find somebody who would like to work on your project. So it's a matter of, uh, you know, yes, I agree things might change between now and uh, the official, you know, June 1st when mentees start working on it. Um, but, you know, we are pretty flexible and I think we gave a lot of, you know, uh, uh, really for the mentors, right, to adjust as things progress or, you know, if there are certain blockers or, you know, you can always change the milestones and um, some of the outcomes that you're hoping uh, the, this project and the mentee to accomplish. Did that answer your question, Tracy? Uh, I, I think so, right? I think it sounds like there's flexibility um obviously the the more specific we can be in our request the the probably the better it will be for getting applications um and that maybe uh, something that's generic like you know help out on a feature in project x is probably not the way to go uh, i think that's what i've heard right so i did have um, there's a section uh on our confluence uh called uh project proposal if you look at there we're yes you know we you know you will if it will be nice for this project to be you know pretty uh scoped out so that you know sometimes if it's too broad it's it's hard for uh people who are applying to your project to know exactly what you're looking for um so it, it would be really nice to be more clearly scoped and structured. Uh, obviously, it needs to be related to you know any of our hyperledger projects or labs. Um, but really, the mentors have quite a bit of flexibility to adjust things as they as 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 you go, because it's really we're trying to create a learning uh, opportunity uh, for the mentees who are you know new contributors uh, for the community, and also you know for the mentors like yourself, right, to um, to work with uh, these new <laughs> developers, uh, adjust things as they go. Good, Dave. Okay, thank you. Yep. Uh, yeah, I wanted to point out that we've had discussions this year about being very careful um, with the scope of these projects. Um, last summer, uh, to a greater degree, two summers ago, to a lesser degree, we ran into projects that were too big, too complex, too difficult for the kinds of students and, and community members that were doing these mentorships. Um, so this year, I think the goal was to try to pick something very narrow, something very doable. And um, those tend to not be you know, bigger picture, uh, critical path kinds of tasks. So if I hear you right, Tracy, I, I, I don't think that we're gonna have that much of a concern because, you know, I don't wanna be, I don't, I personally would not like to see proposals for, you know, adding a new key type to some core fabric CA thing, right? Which would be right in the critical path for the next delivery. I think these should be more researchy, more aspirational, more several versions down the road kind of projects that are also very narrow in scope. It's kind of a hard um, balance to cut, but um, I think that's why we're starting earlier so that we can have a longer time to review and revise these proposals. All right, so. Hopefully everybody is aware now and understands a little bit uh, what this is about. And uh, we can uh, move forward. If anybody has any further questions, they can obviously reach out to me or anybody else in the staff. Thanks. Thank you. All right, let's move on. We have two quarterly reports that got posted. Um, Judging from the response, I see even though Fabric was uh, only posted yesterday, uh, quite a few members have managed to get through it and uh, review that. So thank you all for your effort. Of course, Andrea is always on top and posted the report on Sotooth on time. And, um, and so I did 
didn't see anybody raising any questions or neither the report uh, did so. So I don't know that there needs to be any discussions about any of those reports. This is your chance if you have any questions you didn't raise in the weekend. If not, yeah, Dano. So what are these reports do? Um, I went to bed last night and Fabric wasn't on. I wake up, it's on the agenda all of a sudden. How much time should we have to review these before they show up on the agenda? So the way I have been handling this is that, you know, I look at how many people have actually reviewed it before. And I understand that, you know, if it's just before the meeting, people may not have a chance, in which case, I, I bring it up again on the next call so that people don't, you know, you don't need to stress out if you didn't have a chance, it's okay. I'll just, you know, it's not the, um, it's not like they were closing the, the, the common period now. One thing that I'll point out, and I'm not quite sure how to automate this, is that I have these quarterly reminders set up um, automatically. Uh, and then I have a reminder one week before it's due. And I don't have a way to change that reminder text to say in one week, this is due. Uh, so it seems that the way people are acting is they get the first reminder that, hey, you have a week. And they think that, you know, uh, wow, it was due today. And they scramble to get it done. Uh, yeah, and in fact, I mean, maybe the due date should be at least a couple of days before, so that as you know, that's that last point. They everybody has a bit of time to review them before the meeting. But sure, you know, I think we there, there's no, I, I think there is no um, real negative impact of not having reviewed it at the time it's first put on the agenda. As I said, I was I I oftentimes put that again. You know, if I feel like okay, this was just brought in and. It's not possible that everybody has a chance to look at it. I just put it again on the next call. And so you, I give you two weeks really to, or at least the whole week to review it between two calls. Does that work for you, Dano? Yeah. Um, I mean, when we get into uh, the badging proposal, there's going to be some mechanics around that. So I just want to ask about the current practices. Yeah. I understand. Sounds good. Thanks. Anything else? Anybody else? All right, if not, let's move on. There's actually no presentation today. I do want to remind people, I think it was interesting, we had a couple of presentations already, and uh, I encourage all the other projects to take the opportunity to come to the TSC and uh, give a bit more of uh, an insights beyond what's coming through the reports, you know on what's going on in your project. It's just like a 15, 20 minute presentation, nothing more, so it's not a huge amount of work. So that brings us to the discussion points. So we have a couple of them. Um, first one, Rai. Sure. Go ahead, please. I was trying to figure some stuff out and uh, uh, I realized that the common repo structure was approved almost a year ago. Uh, and in fact, uh, Chris Ferris's uh, pull request for the fabric repo was rejected for a copy of repo lenter.json, uh, which was the one that was used as, a, as an exemplar. And uh, Caliper is the only project that has a repo lenter.json in place. Um, so, yeah. And so I thank you for bringing this up. I have quite a few things to say. and. To, for everybody's sake, you know, uh, Rai actually said, you know, do we need to have that on the agenda or is sending a, a message to everybody enough? And I said, no, let's put it on the agenda because I want to take that as an opportunity to, to bring what I think is a problem. So first, you know, I have realized that, you know, before that, it's been on my mind that we, we have made some decisions regarding you know, uh, certain policies basically we have agreed to live by that I don't think we are necessarily good at implementing or enforcing if the case might be. Uh, so for instance, you know, we said, hey, uh, 
you know, when projects create new RFCs, they should inform all the other projects. And maybe an email to the TSC should be sent to the maintainers list, that kind of stuff. I don't think this is happening. And, uh, and here we have the common repository structure. That's another one. I have to say, right, it's a bit misrepresenting because there is one thing that I've realized from your messages. I have actually done a year ago when we agreed to do this, you know, I've gone through quite a few of the fabric related repos and, and gone through, you know, um, the exercise of running the repo linter and trying to fix some of the problems. But I did not go as far as submitting the repo linter JSON file to the repository. And it, you know, so I wouldn't conclude because it's not part of the repo that it's not used at all. Um, and there is a question which is related, I guess, is should we, you know, ask everybody to have one and make it part of the repo indeed? Okay. I don't so, know if in the common repository structure we have the repo linter JSON file being there. I, so I see that Daniel raised his hand. Um, I, I want to, the, the point below this, which is actually what drew me to this, is uh, there, I was trying to find out if repo linter had an option to flag what the main branch was, what the master branch was. So that's the only reason that I was looking in the repos themselves. So anyway, uh, Daniel. So um, the particular software we're using is kind of a moving target with some of the opportunities. When it was uh, presented a year ago, you had to put repo linter.json in your repository, but they've since updated it so that you can have repo linter be anywhere and then point it at your project. And in the community tools, I wrote a little script that would clone your repo, bring the JSON in, run it and get a report and, and spit it out. But um, one thing that I need to make the time to, to happen they have a version of repo linter that works as a GitHub action. Um, we can't point to a JSON that's in a separate repo, but we, with that particular action, but it can be written to do that. So my thought is that rather than requiring people to put repo linter JSON in there and make it a part of the structure, we just need to have an automated action that will put a report as part of their checkup policies like we already have for DCO. DCO's a TSC policy, it's a Linux Foundation policy, and it's enforced as part of the action. Whether we make it a blocker for the check-in, I think is something like this that can be mechanically checked, should be mechanically checked, whether or not it gates a thing because it gets it into people's uh, position automatically. And we don't have to change their repository structure to get a report on a standard repo linter.json. And it also protects the repo linter.json from falling out of date when it gets updated as well, if we keep it centralized. Okay, so one point uh, important, I think, to, to remind everybody of is that we didn't say that the common repository structure was mandated on all the projects. We have encouraged projects to, you know, be, to use the common repository structure. So we could, I don't think it'd be, you know, unless we want to make the, change the decision, we cannot just say, hey, we are going to impose it on everybody by running the tool automatically and flagging projects that are compliant and so on. And that's also why I thought that being a repository, repo lint uh, JSON file per project uh, was reasonable because you could, you know, you could have variations that would be acceptable. So we- Is it the point of a standard to say, this is what you do, not this is a strongly worded guideline, do whatever you want? So yeah, I think we have to distinguish between musts and shoulds uh, and may, right? Yes, <laughs> uh, to use what that RFC uh, terminology is, and 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 you know, you know, I think we all want to be nice people, and 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 you know, generally tend to default to shoulds, but um, there is a point I think to to saying must if we want to um, have a degree of consistency across the projects and and do what we think are our best practices, uh, not just best practices, but but something stronger. So. Um, so I think you know maybe revisiting that and going is this important enough that we tie it to something like uh, graduation from uh, incubation to active uh, or something to be expected of all active projects or something like that um, is another dimension we could we could add to this. Tracy. Yeah, can you open that link, Ryan? I want you guys to read this right and what we accept it. 
Adopt repo ledger with a policy as in Fabric PR 630. Each repo will add the same repo link JSON file and the CA team will periodically run a check to ensure projects are in compliance. So everything that everybody has just said doesn't match the formal proposal <laughs> and, and what we actually talked about. So uh, Thank you, what we're Tracy. suggesting is we're going to change that formal proposal and so somebody should put a new proposal in place. All right. Thanks, Tracy, for keeping us on this there. <laughs> yeah, and this is this is actually the this is the the commit that was rejected. So, thank you, Tracy, because this is when I this is when I started going down. I thought that this is like the Berenstain Bears thing, Berenstain Stein, right? It's like, am I in an alternate reality? I thought this was decided, and then I went and looked, and in fact, it was decided, and Chris's PR was rejected for whatever is reason. Is there a reason? Can you show me the bottom of this page? It wasn't rejected; it was withdrawn. So we didn't understand any of the history here okay i for so whatever reason it wasn't merged moved it. okay interesting all right so i guess i mean unless anybody wants to challenge the decision we had initially made i would uh, then say okay we all need to do better at implementing the decision we've made so the and then there's the question of hey, how do we enforce this? You know, uh, I suppose we could ask Rai every now and then to check on all the repos to see who is not compliant. I don't want to be the bad cop. Um, Grace? No, but you just send us the report. The TSC is the bad cop. Uh, okay. Grace? Somebody has to get the, gather the data, right? Yeah, I think um, one idea, Arno, is we could have um, uh, every decision we make have a TSC kind of owner or representative or follow through person, you know, to be the one to kind of uh, track it to conclusion and, and be the kind of accountable party. That way, as Rai said, it's not on him. It's, it's you know, a TSC action, not, you know, and um, it's not kind of on the staff to do that. And that way, you know, they can work with Rai or, but there's kind of that point of contact to kind of uh, follow through with what, whatever decisions made. Just, just one idea. No, that's an interesting idea. I... Any other comments here? Mark. Mark. Hi. So the uh, the thing uh, the way it was written said it depended on the fabric one, and the fabric one was shown to be invalid. So do we start over? No, there is one in the in the community tool repo. That's the one I used. All right. Thank you. Caliper, there, there is one project that has it as well. All right. Um, I don't know if you want to wrap the, the sub point to this into that or not. The, the piece about the master branch versus main question mark. Yeah, that's a different question, though. I mean, Right, I, we, we probably should uh, get it. Uh, I mean, I, I plan to talk about it, but in fact, I don't know why it's put as a sub bullet. I would think that they can be. It's a sub bullet because that trying to answer that question is how I discovered the. One yeah, above. yeah, but the repo linter doesn't look at this, does it? No, that's what I was. Okay, so that's yeah, what let's I mean. like forget all that. Let's move on. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, but okay. So, are we good on the repo linter? Everybody is going to make the effort in their own project to add repo linter .json to their repo and try to comply. And um, I think we should make you know. I don't know if anybody wants to become the ambassador for this, as Grace was suggesting. Maybe we have somebody. On point, but uh, otherwise, I suggest we we spread the word. We tell, yeah, Grace. Uh, just a couple of questions. So, um, obviously, the TSC we don't represent every project, so um, I'm not sure who would follow up. You know, Dano and I can go back for Basu, for example, but I'm not sure if we have someone you know from 
uh, you know, burrow, for example, on, on the GSC. So just want to make sure we don't forget about them and the follow-ups and stuff. No, you, uh, you're absolutely there's... right. But so that's where the staff is helpful, right? Because the staff is in contact with all the different projects. And we have several means of communication. You know, we have the TSC, we have the maintainers list. That includes all the maintainers of all the projects. And uh, at least I believe everybody's on, right? Right? Or is that somebody can opt out? Uh, not every single person is on there that touches on another pain point, um, which could probably take the rest of the hour. So the, the answer is no. All right. So at least we can reach out to some of the maintainers through the maintainers list, I guess. And uh, so I think, you know, we should make an effort to communicate. Grace, your point is valid. It's not like, you know, all the projects are directly represented on the TSC but I think the stuff can help disseminate the message. Okay, uh, right, I'm happy to help too if, if you need help or reaching out and all that and, and pointing to this because yeah, I know it's not fun for you <laughs> and uh, don't wanna, um, and wanna make sure, yeah, it's communicated clearly to everyone. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Arun? Hey, um, just wanted to quickly point out that beginning of this TSC term in late, I guess in October, we had the similar topic discussed that how do we make the communication effective from these meetings to rest of rest of the community i guess um, it would be nice if we can bring that topic back soon like we can actually tie um, this with try these kind of topics to that yeah it's a tough questions it's a tough question. I don't know how to answer it. So I'm happy to discuss it, but I don't know. Okay, let's uh, let's leave it at this for now. And uh, it's already half past the hour. So I, I want to make sure we touch on everything today. So let's get to the other point you have, uh, Ryan. Um, sure. So this is, uh, I don't know if everyone saw, we had a uh, DCI working group uh, blog post about this this week about, you know, the, uh, the default branch naming moving from, you know, uh, non-inclusive language like master to more inclusive language like main. And we have, uh, as of the time that I wrote this, uh, 129 repos under the Hyperledger umbrella are using master as a default. So I guess my question to the TSC is, uh, should or should we incentivize this like as a project to move that? Uh, or is this something that is on the, the maintainers? Um, and I know that Brian had some ideas around this, so uh, I will see the floor to Brian. Uh, yeah, not, not much more than asking, you know, maybe we can use the fact that we're also a bit behind on um, uh, recognizing some projects uh, uh, as active projects rather than incubation and um, use this as a, uh, you know, uh, I, I, again, carrots and sticks, right? Um, I think if a project is active, that might be something that we set as a requirement if something's in incubation. Um, if they move to this, maybe we, um, as, a, as a TSC and staff, help them go the rest of the way to uh, applying for and getting uh, active status. Just the thought was to, to tie that in some way. Um, maybe that's helpful, maybe not, but, um, but certainly hope that um, as we raise this and get it out through maintainers or, or other channels that more of the community can be encouraged to do that. The other thought was um, trying to set a date, you know, and, and by, for example, March 1st saying, okay, at the very least you should have copied your uh, master branch to something to a main or, or something else. Um, let's just settle on main. Um, uh, and then by April 1st, um, using that new, new copy exclusively, uh, perhaps deleting the uh, the old one. Because I know there's tooling implications uh, for, for such a migration. Some, some build tools and others will depend upon there being a master branch existing, and those would have to be modified before you could properly delete the master branch. So I have the suggestions for how to implement this or enforce them. And this is also valid for the previous point about the, uh, the repo linter. I think we should make that part of the quarterly reports. And even we could add those questions literally in the templates, but people may not get it. And then it's up to us, TSC members, when we review the report to you know, ask if it's not there. 
are, are, are you, you know, are you compliant with Ripple Inter? Uh, uh, did you make the change from master branch to main? And we have, we could actually say, you know, by the next quarterly report, you should all be compliant. And that gives us somewhat of a rolling uh, uh, and deadline, but eventually we should all get them all. I, 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 um, I think tying that to active status is not the right thing because of some projects, you know, this is actually a fairly rare occurrence. So it's, you know, it's not going to, to motivate many, but if we, if we use the quarterly reports, that's something we consistently get. And that gives basically projects a three month period. Of course, the ones that have coming next week maybe need to have a bit more break, but you know, a more time, but uh, essentially I think the quality reports are a very good way to enforce those decisions we make. Okay, Gary? At least to monitor them and to ask specifically, have you done this? Gary? Yeah. Gary? Oh, I saw that you unmuted, so I thought you were gonna. Oh, sorry, I, uh, I switched over. Uh, I had to switch to my phone, so I'm unmuted on the thing, and muted on my phone. Okay, no worries. Anyone else, any comments? What do you think of my idea? Personally, I think that's a lot easier than having a date. Um, I think the idea of having like a rolling deadline is uh, nice because it'll spread the workload out. So I'm looking forward to the idea this? except it came from Arno. Mm. Uh, I can't support it. Okay, I'm, I'm like I'm like muting you. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's what Gary, happens. You invite yourself. me to say something. <laughs> I don't know how to interpret the sign as if people agree they don't care or they disagree do, silently. Do we say rather than next week, starting like with the first report due in March? From that point on, give people a month to get it done if we're concerned about it taking a while. We could yeah, just say, that's, that's... what if we just said, <clears throat> this starts Q2, right? Like sure. the first the first report in Q2, your first report yes. in, in Q2 is give us status. And the, your first report in Q3 is we expect it to be done. And I, I'm using the royal we. I'm obviously not a member of the TSC. No, I, I think that's a very good proposition, actually. I, I like this proposal. We can just say that, and it gives everybody quite a bit of time to get their act together. And uh, we can disseminate, if they haven't cut that up by the first report, we can flag it and say, hey, watch out. You know, <laughs> We can ask for a status report on those questions specifically, and then on the next one, they have to comply. So everybody agrees with this? Do we have to make a decision? We can make that official. Sounds good to me. Good I like it. Okay, so the proposal before the floor is to uh, require a status update in your first report for Q2 2021 and then compliance by Q, your first report in Q3 of 2021. That's a proposal? Yeah. Okay, so someone else should bring it to the floor and motion it. Well, I bring it to the floor. Second. Okay. Anybody disagrees with this? Who wants to oppose it? Anybody wants to abstain? It's an active abstain where you speak up to abstain. Otherwise, I will assume everybody agrees and this is therefore uh, unanimously approved. Thank you. Okay, I think we did pretty well on that. I haven't made one of those decisions in a while, so that's good. Okay, so with that taken care of, let's get to the project badging proposal. So we talked about this. There was um, an open issue. We looked at different aspects and talked about, you know, creating new metrics and a badging mechanism to measure how projects are doing 
beyond what we currently have that basically you know is looked at uh, when you actually transition from essentially incubation to active status and Dano actually put a proposal together that's been on the wiki for a few weeks now uh, some of us have commented on this there is actually two parts to it and i will let Dano speak but uh, i would like to you know solicit uh, more discussion or if you know if there is general agreement we could move to the next stage so Dano, you have the floor. So yeah, there's there's two wiki pages on this, and I consider it something that would happen in three parts. Um, the first one, the first page that I put together is I took our existing active project standards that have been agreed on to get to active and conceptualized what would they look like as a set of badges. Um, the second part is the second wiki page, which is the process of how would you get and uh, essentially challenge badges if you disagree with someone's assessment. And the third step that's not on here that I wanna hold off until later because it can really gum up the works is the discussion of adding new badges. Cause I think that's one of the real values of a badging system is there's some new badges that aren't necessarily appropriate for new active projects, but are great indicators of continuing projects like the one that Rai brought up, I think it was Rai that brought it up about how quick you are to respond to GitHub issues and pull requests that shows how responsive a community is that's not necessarily, you know, something that's captured by the current active process and shouldn't be because it's not a one and done thing. It's a continual process. So the first step I went through um, and tried to split it up into a set of number of badges based on the major sub points. And I put into it a set of criteria, an objective criteria to say, what does this badge cover? And the second part is I said, you know, what sort of evidence should you sub submit to say, I have this badge and also the frequency that you would need to submit that evidence. Because some badges, um, you know, are kind of one and done. We're on Hyperledger infrastructure. I mean, that's pretty obvious once you get over there. Uh, and that doesn't change until something dramatically changes. Um, but some, some stuff needs to be, I put in there, they're called the renewable badges, that they're good for like a year. And every year you need to submit new evidence to say, hey, we're still doing this. Hey, we're still releasing software. We're still up to date on our licensing. So if we go through some of these, you know, give the name of the badge, legal, you know, what it describes, the uh, criteria, and then the evidence. I think decentralized is probably going to be the most contentious one because that's always the most contentious issue with, um, with uh, the active process. And it lists, you know, what the goal is, what the objective standards are, and what the preferred evidence is, and how often you need to give it. Um, and um, so, if you have everything but the decentralized, this gives a way for projects to say, hey, we have everything around it. We just have this one issue with getting more, more, uh, more diverse corporate representation in here. And I'm using the word decentralized instead of diversity, reserving diversity for talking about people and decentralization for talking about organizations. Because we might want to put a diversity badge in there. So it means that people think about it when they you know, see diversity in a project. And all, you know, it's got to get two different words to do different separate concepts. Um, so the second step is the badging process subpage. Um, right, could click on that. So the general process that I, I would propose for this is that projects self-certify. They say, hey, we have this badge. And they do it as part of the quarterly report. We put a section of the quarterly report say new badges or renewed badges. And they would list the badges that are new to them or renew and put links to the evidence. Maybe it's a separate wiki page, maybe it's small enough. It's a direct link in the report and say, hey, we think we are in these badges. Um, now, because we're in a decentral, uh, distributed ledger technology, um, you know, we need to deal with, you know, Byzantine fault tolerance. We should presume that we can handle at least a third of the people um, behaving badly. We need to have some sort of a formal process around it. So the process around that is that you would be able to challenge someone else's badge if you don't think the evidence is sufficient. And that goes into the question I had about you know, how much time do we have to review these quarterly reports? So I would expect there would be some revision to the particular mechanics of this. But basically when a report's been out for a week, you would have a week to challenge it. Um, and we would limit the challenges to TSC members or maintainers. So some random Joe couldn't come in and challenge a badge and cause problems. It's gotta be someone with, with a stake in the game. And so basically they challenge it and you know, you try and work it out. And if you can't work it out, ultimately you bring it to a vote for the TSC. 
And if a majority of the TSC quorum says that they have the badge, they have the badge. And if the quorum of the TSA vote says they don't have the badge and they don't have the badge. Now, sometimes this can be because of a mistake. Um, they didn't provide the right evidence. So there's one opportunity to cure the challenge the next week and say, you're right, we, you know, we only listed three companies and two of them are the same. We have like five different companies here. So here's a different member maintainers from a different company to kind of re review the, 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 uh, the uh, evidence. And, you know, for take of, uh, you know, ease, ease of uh, the process, you can do that only once. And if you don't get it, and if the challenge is not accepted to overturn the challenge, um, then you can just come back the next quarter. Um, so I think the key things of this proposal are that you self-certify, you do it every quarter, um, challenges are challenged once and you can attempt to correct that uh, successful challenge once. And if you can't do that, you come back at the next quarter um, and try again. And the third step that we haven't gone into is once we get this in place, we should bring in new, new badges that represent things that aren't necessarily um, aren't necessarily related to active status, but are related to the health of an ongoing project. Like, do you let PRs um, burn in the sun and no one looks at them, or do you respond to them within 24 hours? You know, those are some things that I think are really important for ongoing community health. And if we give them a badge, we incentivize projects to give some sort of a, you know, a, a green light on a dashboard to say, hey, we need to fix that to get some sort of an incentive and gives the TSC some sort of teeth when they do some policies that can be enforced via a badging system. All right, thank you, Dano. So I know that some of us have already looked at it and commented sometimes as question, but not everybody has. I would like to open the floor to questions if anybody has an immediate reaction. Otherwise, I think what I'd like us to do is, you know, give everybody another week to look through this if they haven't that chance to do that before. So we can make that a proposal for the TSC to decide on next week. And, um, you know, unless there is something that, you know, it triggers a big discussion and then we will postpone the decision. Once we have decided if it's approved, then, we can go into the implementation phase where Dano turns that into a pull request against the document uh, repository. So is there any questions? I would, I would uh, just one minor comment. I mean, the, on the, on the um, expiration part, I think should be, I know it's there. I didn't see it initially, as you may see in one of the comments I put down there. Um, and it's there, but I know I think it would be worth highlighting it a bit differently than the way you have on the other page. Instead of in parentheses where you say like annually at least, I would make it a separate entry in the badge definition record, if you will. Yeah, that's a user experience thing I'll fix. Arun. Hey, um, so th thanks, Dano. So a quick question to you. Have you considered an automated way of issuing badges instead of somebody self-certifying and then somebody else going to review it? Um, the this, this self-certifying tool, or it, let's say, even if we spend a week or two on developing such a thing, it, it helps in maintaining the status up to date and without much interference. So I thought of this, and the problem is some of these badges, if we could go back to the badge pages, scroll down through some of them. Some of them, at the end of the day, are subjective. Um, alignment is a great example of a subjective one. Um, there's no way you can write an automated tool to say that we align with our chart or we align with type emerging. Um, so my thought is things that can be automated probably belong in something like a repo letter tool, something that can be completely and totally automated. Um, because if it's automated, the TSC just sets a standard and you set a tool to check the standard and you put that on the dashboard. And maybe we will get, I mean, I can honestly see repo structure, repository structure being um, a badge that you would self-certify. Maybe we create a third category of automated badging um, that, that shows up with a tool passes in and updates the dashboard. So you know, maybe we, we could uh, add that 
um, to the to the standard as we add new badges. But as far as the active status, I think every single one of these categories has at least a tiny bit of subjective judgment that goes into each and every one of them. Um, oh, okay. Can I continue or like? Yeah, go ahead. Others? If you go want ahead. to follow up, go ahead. Okay. Sorry for the interruption, hard sorry. Um, so yeah, and on that, maybe I have another thought I can follow up as a comment on, on the page uh, for these subjective thoughts, right? Maybe we can have a process because um, PSC has the reports, quarterly reports. And instead of letting everyone adding their comments, probably we can have a voting based thing within the TSC. Or uh, we could have a, a, a consortium kind of people. I mean, who, one who understands the project better plus the TSC. I'll, I'll probably propose that on, on, on a comment in the process page. That's all. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Hot. Hey. Um Thanks, Dano, first of all, for putting this together. I think this is a, a great step forward. Um, I had a couple of comments. First of all, I'm a little worried that the challenge process might become adversarial. You know, I don't want I don't want this to like, you know, to be used to essentially like nitpick minor things. Uh, and I particularly don't want it to be like a work inflator where, you know, say uh, it takes me like, you know, five minutes to write up like uh, a small paragraph on, you know, like a minor complaint on, you know, some say repo structure. And then it takes say Arno like two hours to have to respond to that. Um, so so that's that's one thing. And, and we also don't want it to be the case, like, I guess, like Rai pointed out with the, the common repo stuff where we all just ignore sort of each other's shortcomings either. So I think we need to have, um, steps for both. Um, and I also would like to say that, uh, you know, going forward, I think um, a great thing to do would be is if we could start sort of by listing all of the badges and what we want for, uh, for badging criteria in a way that allows us to sort of decide things individually, because I think that there will be a lot of badging stuff uh, that we can all agree on pretty easily, but there will be some stuff that requires a lot more discussion. Like we haven't even begun to talk about uh, the the project diversity metric, which has historically always been the sticking point um, for this kind of stuff. Um, so I think it, you know just just getting this ready for sort of badge by badge discussion, so we can get the easy stuff out of the way and then uh, hammer out the hard points. Um, is a great strategy going forward. So there, there is a badge that touches on the diversity aspect. Though. Right, and I think this will be by far the most contentious one. <laughs> but I, I have to say, I, I do agree with the first statement you made regarding the adversarial nature. And if you look at the comment I put, uh, one of my comments was very much in that line, like it felt like the escalation process in case of challenges and all seemed to be very formal and very quick. And I know Dano says, well, I don't know, you know, it's necessary anyway, but uh, I also feel like it'd be nice to have a way to achieve the same outcome without making it adversarial. And I don't know how to do that though, because you, you, you made that comment, but you haven't offered an alternate solution, have you? No, I have not. I'm hoping someone can come up with a good one. <laughs> I'm, I'm welcome to alternate solutions. And, you know, I could rewrite that part to say that at first there is a mediation process where you speak with the maintainers and make it put more verbiage on that. But if we're going to have objective criteria that, or subject, if we're going to not have objective criteria, it's just automated. But if we're going to have a subjective criteria at some point, there's going to have to be a group judgment. And something like that, if it's clear how the group judgment happens, people know what they're getting into. So the, the formality does, yes, it looks like it could become adversarial, um, but it provides certainty as to what will really happen. So when you're through the mediation stage, um, you understand that, you know, well, I've gone through this and, you know, half the TSC has said bad things about the evidence on my badge. So maybe I should just withdraw it instead of go through a vote. So I'll, I'll put in some more verbiage about the mediation and discussion that has to happen before a challenge uh, can be voted on. 
I mean, even when you talk about mediation, it sounds very formal again. And I, my opinion was more like, you know, we should have some wording about encouraging the different parties to talk to one another and figure out whether there's a real disconnect or not. Because, you know, <laughs> that, that's kind of informal and maybe sweeping the issue under the rug, I don't know. But it feels like that might be enough to diffuse some major challenge that would then blow up into a big controversial thing. Angela has And if has it doesn't it work, while. the process would, I know, the process would still function, but more as a fallback, not like as the normal way, you know. The, the. So Angelo has been waiting. Yeah, uh, thank you, Arnold. So I must admit that I'm, uh, if I can say this straight, I'm against this, uh, this thing. Uh, for the simple reason that I, I still haven't seen, or uh, maybe this will come later during a discussion, a discussion about uh, the benefits against the, the costs of this initiative. And in particular, I was thinking, who is our customer? Who is the customer of these badges? It's who is going to use the, 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 who wants to use this uh, Hyperledger project. But what counts really? I mean, it's... Uh, I, I think what the only thing that counts here is the, the, the number of success stories that each project can tell, not the, ba the badge that we put. Uh, first of all, I also don't want to go in, into any political discussions or not, and say, oh, this should, uh, they, they should get this badge or for some other reason. I personally I don't want to do this, uh, this, kind, of, uh, this kind of work. But I, I really think we should analyze the costs and the benefits for our end customer who is going to look at these badges, why we should ask the projects to, to spend cycles on these badges rather than spending cycles on making, on making their projects successful. This is, this is really my point. Okay. I mean, the, Thank you. All, right, all right, now that's a, that's a fair question, but I do think we have had quite a few motivating factors to make us look into this. So first, you're aware that we have, you know, this notion of active status versus incubation. And the underlying point here is that we, a lot of us feel like this is not an appropriate way to convey uh, the, the, what's, going really, what's really going on into the projects. The issue that we're trying to address is confusion among the community of users who come to Hyperledger and see those labels and don't actually understand what they mean. And, uh, we, we've heard from the ARIES project the other day that, for instance, in their case, they have a bit of a mixed bag situation because they have different sub projects and, you know, and, and so they don't know if they can qualify as an active status and so on. So we are trying to provide more clarity as to the status of the different projects by having those badges that communicate and that are more dynamic than the, uh, the status of a project between incubation and active, which is kind of a one-time threshold and doesn't seem to capture, you know, the possible evolutions. We have had discussions about, you know, project diverging from the initial charter. We, there were several issues like this that have come up and this is an attempt to address some of those issues. Um, then may I recommend the first uh, you go, I mean, let's ask to the project, uh, to the project leaders uh, to make their project more streamlined, uh, that someone when comes to, the, to, the, to their project, they, it's clear what they do, what they deliver. I mean, it's up to them. At the end of the day, it's the project leaders. They want their project to be used, right? It's in their interest. If they don't do that, if they don't make uh, the decision uh, easy, they will just die. So, uh, hey, but by the way, before anybody speaks, can I just say I'm raising my hand, so I want to be put in the queue this time? Okay. <laughs> scary, Let's go to Tracy first. Yeah, I, I just want to comment on the uh, the challenge process, right? That seems like an administrative nightmare. That's what it seems like to me. Um, and I know when we initially had talked about kind of the, the challenges that we have with moving from incubation to active and, and Dano and Grace, you can comment on this because of the challenges that you had with getting BASU to active, right? Is that it, it felt very subjective to you as you went through that process. And so the only way that I think we have any chance of making this successful is if our criteria can be completely objective, 
basically, yes, you are, or no, you're not. And if you're not, then you don't get the badge. If you are, then you get the badge. Um, I think anything that adds subjectivity to this isn't any better than what we have today and just uh, adds confusion. All right, thank you, Tracy. Dino is back on. Let Gary go first. I think he asked first. Okay, Gary. Yeah, I think I would kind of agree with Tracy. So I, I like the, I, and maybe I see where Angela was coming from too, right? And Hart. So I think the only reason that something gets adversarial is if somehow this thing turns into some type of competition. And then I think it becomes very careful as to which things you decide to badge, right? Um, and which things we think are important that community users, you know, want to know about a product, right? And I'm not sure that getting into like features, not that they were all in there, is the right thing. Like, it's like if we had, I like the original idea, right? We said there was an adherence to standards. Okay, so you have to, I don't know what, you know, do, do, do this thing, you have to have 100% test completion, I don't know, whatever, right? But if you think about when you go to an open source project, right? What are the things that we think are important for somebody to check? And that are fairly objective, that you could verify yourself, right? Um, you know, that's why people put the test badge in there, right? You know, how much, what percent of tests are failing? Um, last date, right? Um, I think there are interesting metrics on GitHub stuff, right? The pull requests, response to pull requests. Those things are kind of interesting, right? They're pretty much objective and not subjective. But, and I guess, isn't the goal to provide some level of information, some commonality or some level of information about our users to give them confidence in why they should use, why they should feel confident in using the code base? Isn't that really the, isn't that really the end goal? Now, feature function is different than that, right? I can feel confident in using a code base that may not have any feature and function I want. They're two separate things. And I think we have to be careful not to mix them. No, that's correct. Okay, Dano, I'll give you the floor and we'll have to close after that. But I'm glad we had this discussion, obviously. People have quite a bit to say. So to circle back to uh, Angelo's original question about you know what problem is it solving? Um, I think that the current active process is broken. Um, there are projects that deserve to be active that aren't. And there are projects at one point that were active that no longer meet the standards. Um, and what that comes down to is there have been salespeople from hyperledger companies that in sales called and said, oh no, you shouldn't use this hyperledger project because it's still in incubation, which was never the goal of the active inactive. It's supposed to be a reflection of the community, but people downstream using it don't see that. They don't understand that nuance. They see incubation and they think not ready for production. Um, there are absolutely incubating projects that are absolutely um, worthy of use in production today in Hyperledger. So that's my main motivation of getting this is to get something that downstream people will be able to accurately use and that it says what it claims to say rather than getting muddled up with, you know, what people think it means. All right. Thank you for resetting the, the, the goal here. I, I completely share uh, Dano's goal here. I think this is really what this is about and we're trying to achieve. I do, uh, you know, it seems pretty clear we might need to massage a bit more some of these things, either the, the badges themselves or and and all the, the, the process. But let's leave it at this for now. I encourage everybody to continue the discussion either through the mailing list or on the wiki. For now, we have to close. So thank you all for joining. We'll talk again next week.